So, welcome to the one and only podcast approved by Duncan Idaho. <laughs> but I'm <laughs> funny. Wasn't it Dune? It was. It was the first. It was Dune Part One, right? That we were so surprised was on Max. Yeah, it was on Max like the same day. The it came weekend out. it came out. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't believe it either. But it was also really cool because realistically, I wasn't going to go to the movie theater to watch it. Uh, you um, know r- exactly. Yeah. And so it's like, uh, okay, yeah, I'll watch this since since it's in my own room. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, we watched Wonka uh-huh. on Max. Lots of Tim Tam Shellman earlier this week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. It was actually really fun. Yeah. Here's the thing. I'm so sick of the sequels and prequels and remakes and stuff like Re-imaginings. that. Reimaginings. Right. You know, but this one Except actually- Except for Into the Spider-Verse. Amazing. Right. That Well, that's different too. They're doing something so different than they've ever done before. You know, it's kind of like Barbie. And across the- Yeah. You're right. Because like, realistically, there have been like 26 other Barbie movies- and then there's this one, right? Straight to DVD. Right, right. And, yeah. they, and they're all like based on different stories that are like normal fairy tales and stuff. And then they completely reimagined Barbie and made a story about her as an actual Barbie. You know, so it wasn't anything like the previous Barbie movies. And I kind of feel like Wonka wasn't quite to that level, but it was like around that level. I, y- you know, and I'm <sighs> as far as reimaginings go. As far as reimaginings go, like we're all into the multiverse now with Rick Mm -hmm. and Morty and Spider-Verse and Avengers Endgame. Right. Like it's all about the multiverses now. And yeah, I could, I could watch that stuff, I think forever. Like I've been a Peter Parker fan since the 80s. Oh, sure. And now I'm a Miles Morales fan. Mm -hmm. Like I like new shiny toys. Yeah. Now- I watched the Oscars. You haven't spent much time at my Mojo Dojo Casa house. I've been so busy. Week. Yeah. You, you've been busy. You had your thing. I had mine. Uh-huh. Um, but I, okay. So we watched Wonka together. Uh-huh. And I also watched the Oscars presentation. It's on Hulu. Uh-huh. Kimmel hosted. Not Which, a lot of surprises. And I'm so mad that I missed it, though, because I love watching the Oscars. Gosling sang, uh-huh. I'm just Ken. And I loved his little uh, gentleman, gentleman Prefer Blondes reference in oh, there. did you see the clip? Yeah. Yeah. It it was great. Yeah. Um, let's see. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito <laughs> presenting an award because they were in the movie Twins. Right, and right. And then they called out because they both played Batman villains in the classic <laughs> Tim Burton yes. 80s Batman. Yeah, I remember that. DeVito the Penguin uh-huh. and Schwarzenegger Mr. Freeze. Uh-huh. And then they pointed to Michael Keaton. <laughs> In the audience, just badass. <laughs> That's hilarious. Imagine getting credit for something you did 40 years ago. <laughs> right, right. And but also, he deserves it. Twins is kind of an underrated movie that I'd love to see again. Yeah. It's not that, okay, here's the thing. I'm saying underrated like it was a great movie. It was not, but it was a really fun movie. And it's something that definitely like stuck in my brain for a long time because it was one of the few VHSs that my granny had at her house. So anytime we'd go over there, we'd watch oh. like that or Clueless <laughs> or something like that. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Paul Rudd. Oh, I know. Back Brittany was Murphy. was so cute. Oh, I know. Alicia Silverstone. I loved Brittany Murphy, too. She was so good. Rolling with the homies. <laughs> You know, I was oh, actually, I was helping out at my friend's shop yesterday and her other friend was also there, Jamie, and she did the rolling with the homies thing. And I was like, whoa, dude, <laughs> way to bring me back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, point is that was super, like, that's a movie I want to see again. And Keaton, you know, was a popcorn movie actor. Right. Uh, certainly Birdman proved <laughs> him as a serious actor. I think he was probably before then. Mm-hmm. So I got a little FOMO. You know, right. I watched the Oscars and I'm like, I want to see some stuff. Mm-hmm. So we wa- we also watched Poor Things together. Right. With Which Emma was Stone. a crazy movie. Now we watched that and a lot of just up front, a lot of Emma Stone full frontal. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then she's at the Oscars giving her excess acceptance speech and shouting out her three-year-old daughter. And mm-hmm. I'm like, wait, she's a mom? Yeah. Like last time I remember, she was an easy A. Yeah, I know. I know. And well, I mean, I remember her from La La Land, which she was so oh, good in. Yeah. I love La La Land. Dun, One of my dun, favorite dun, movies. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, just uh, the best. Yeah. Great. Uh-huh. I didn't realize in retrospect, oh, I was looking at a mother in those scenes. Yeah. And um, so I think that's brave. I think she deserves everything she got for that. I mean, 
it's a little less brave when you look like Emma Stone. You know, it's like, oh no, you look perfect. How terrible for you. But you know that's got to be some work, man. Oh yeah, of course. But I mean, that's sort of part of her job. Like if my job was to work out eight hours a day, I would also look great. I, yeah, (laughs) if I, if I had to get naked and we're going to be, we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about nakedness on stage or (laughs) on camera later in this episode. Not what you think. Um, but, but yeah, if that were my job, I would hate my life. It, yeah, I, really I don't would. think I could do it. Like, I don't look good naked. I, I just don't. Yeah. <laughs> Still haven't seen Oppenheimer, but you know what I did watch uh-huh. uh, without you? I hope it's okay. Is because I know you get mad when I watch something. Well, sometimes that, you watch really good stuff that I've been meaning to watch. I watched Maestro. I haven't heard of that one. Okay, never mind. Okay, <laughs> so I don't know who won what for what, uh-huh. but it had Bradley Cooper in it. Now, I I only know Bradley Cooper from Rocket Raccoon and Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. And I remember him from Silver Linings Playbook. Yes. Yeah. And He's that was that. right. And and that was when J Law, mm-hmm. I think Jennifer Lawrence went from right from popcorn Katniss movie. Yeah. From yeah to an actual actress. Serious from yeah. Katniss to actress. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah, Bradley Cooper was good in that as well. He was good. He was in the also one... in Wedding Crashers. Do you remember that? Oh yes, he was. He yeah. was the douche, like yeah, uh, the douche frat... fiance. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, what else was he in that was really like? Uh... Oh, the one with Lady Gaga. A Star Is Born. Yes. Aha! I got like there. Like the third or fourth remake of that film. Right. Yeah. yeah. But but this one, I think. And and some might argue with me, like, oh no, the dude that happened two or three movies ago. Mm-hmm. This is Maestro is the movie that took Bradley Cooper, in my mind anyway, from Pretty Boy, sexy Pretty Boy, Hangover. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah, right. To um, serious actor. Mm-hmm. So he, not only did he have, I think, a, a prosthetic on his nose. Oh. For the whole thing, but they also aged him. Okay, kind of like a uh, Nicole like, Kidman in The Hours. Yes. Yeah. Yes, or Charlize Theron, I think, mm-hmm. in Monster. But did she have a prosthetic in that or just like makeup that made her look purposefully shitty? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't seen that one, actually. Oh, it's good. Yeah, I've heard. I I've mean, heard. it's it's horrible and it's good. Right, yeah. But Maestro, like, it wasn't the movie I wanted to see. Right. But it was so good. It mm-hmm. mostly dealt with his personal life. Now, I have a big thing for conductors. Uh-huh. And the reason I have a big thing for conductors is when you see that name, you recognize, Mm -hmm. you know, the arrangement and the tempo and, and everything else is going to be right on. Right. As someone who knows no names of any conductors, I will take your word on that. Cause realistically, like I don't look at the conductor. I'm just like, Oh, this is a song I want to hear. Great. Well, you know, Leonard Bernstein from REM. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I feel fine. Oh, Sure. Yeah. I mean, I know that because song. that's the, that's one of two parts of the song where they break it down. And that's, and by the way, way before Billy Joel, we didn't start the fire, which I feel is a cheap ripoff <laughs> of REM's. It's the end of the world as we know okay, it. And I fair, feel fine. Fair. Leonard Bernstein was the conductor of the New York Philharmonic and it was a freak accident, by the way. Really? He, you know, they say success comes when preparation meets opportunity. Right. Yeah, I've heard that. They called him one day and said, the conductor is sick. Can you cover? Uh-huh. And he was like, yep. And then he made headlines. Wow. And the rest is history. Of course, right. he did the score for West Side Story. Yes. That yeah. was 20 Which, years later. And also, dude, West Side Story is a bad play. Like, it's just not good. The music is the only thing worthwhile in it. Speaking of multiverses and reimaginings, though, mm-hmm. it is a reimagining of... Romeo and Juliet. Yes. Which also is kind of not great, but at least it's better than West Side Story. Because really... <laughs> okay, I don't know if people realize this, but the entire plot of Romeo and Juliet Juliet takes place over like three or four days. Yeah. They see each other and they're like, fuck yeah, and decide <laughs> to get married, like run away together, and then kill themselves over each other. I think we've mentioned this before, but it's important to point out, uh, and this isn't revisionist history, this is a peek into the past. Oh, sure. Love didn't used to be a thing. Oh, yeah, no. It did not used to be a requisite for marriage. Yeah, marriages were very much more of a business transaction. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was a cautionary tale against love, Mm -hmm. particularly 
teenage love. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing. They're like 13 and 15 in that. Yeah. Or like 14 or something. Yeah. They're so little. They're just babies. Yeah. You know? I mean, you see the the Leonardo DiCaprio one, and they're like at least older teens. They're like 19, 18, somewhere that's in the there. That's the Romeo plus Juliet Baz yes. Lerman. Which is beautiful and Which so well done. I've never seen. <gasps> can we put that on the list? We got yes. a couple to add to the list. Yeah, you know what? That one we can watch this afternoon if you want. <laughs> but I'm big into conductors. Uh-huh. Okay, so there's Leonard Bernstein, conductor uh-huh. of the New York Phil um, from the, I don't know, 30s to the there's 70s. Phil in New York. He's got a guy following him around doing this with his arms. <laughs> I also love Arthur Fiedler from the Boston Pops. Oh, okay. Keith Lockhart from the Utah Symphony from like 98 to 08, who okay. then went on to the Boston Pops. You just like the Boston Pops, Big maybe. fan, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's Leopold Stokowski from Disney's mm-hmm. Fantasia. Okay. You remember that? That one, that one apprentice. actually does sound more familiar than any of the other names that you've spouted off. <laughs> there's Gustavo Dudamel, the uh, mm-hmm. hot, long-haired dude from um, the L.A. Phil. So yeah, okay. there's like when you are searching. Okay, I don't know if you know Can this you about me. Imagine being a hot conductor though, because like if you think of a conductor, he's like balding at least in the back. He's a little guy. He's like usually really small and skinny and like old. And then he just like goes up and waves his ar- his arms oh, around. Yeah. So being a hot conductor and oh, walking out on the stage and having everyone up, go, it's probably weird. Look up <laughs> Gustavo Dudamel. Yeah, okay. He is the dude. He is <laughs> c- conductors have gotten a lot hotter. Really? And then there's Andre Ryu and some people might argue, "Oh, he's just for pop." Yes, he is. <laughs> and I love that. That's cool. I he's, like that. And not only is he a conductor, but he is an arranger and a performer as well. So I'd put him in the pantheon right, of conductors. Right. Anyway, my review of Maestro, uh Leonard Bernstein was kind of a dog. Like he I not mean, only had multiple affairs with women, but also men. Oh. And it sort of bisexual dived. Bisexual king. Yeah. He sort of dived into that. All and, right. and you know, his wife's feelings about that. His, th- Probably the not very good had, feelings. Right. The impact it had on his kids. Probably not very good either. I wanted to watch a movie more like Amadeus or um, uh, the Gary Oldman, Beethoven, Immortal Beloved. Oh, okay. Like okay. I wanted to learn more, more about the process. Yes. Oh, okay. And it wasn't that still a good movie, and boy, did it pow Bradley Cooper in my mind. Okay. One up, one up, one up. All right. I can Man, dig that. Like, I can dig that. Now, do you know if he's the one who won Best Actor this time? I don't know who won. I know. We're so we're so terrible. I, I don't even know. Good thing we're not a news source. We're All just I here know for the is jokes. When Pacino introduced Best Film, like he didn't do all the nominees, he just read the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. Spoiler alert. When That's you watch so funny. when you watch the Oscars on Hulu. <laughs> I feel like there's so much room for error at the Oscars. You know, because so much it's oh, all yeah. live. Yep. <laughs> <laughs>